before we are beginning our shiur, uh, this morning when I was uh, saying the Shemait Sahel, mm. we had three parts. Yeah. So in the second part, uh, I think uh, half the way of it, something is written, I have it in Dutch, but I try to translate it. Okay. That be care that your heart don't go open for other things. You know what right. I mean? Right. Yeah. yeah. Do not stray yeah. after your your yeah. eyes and your heart. Yes. And don't go to other uh, gods or uh, something like that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And the beginning of this sentence. Yeah. Uh, something happened inside of you. Take care mm. that. Uh, that you don't get open for the wrong things. Right. And then I understood the first time I understood it's not only about to 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 look for other gods, but it's about everything. That's true. Don't get open for the things they are asur. Right. It, it's getting getting so deep inside of mm-hmm. you, lying. And not being on time, stealing, not be friendly, don't give to the car. All these things come one time inside of me. So, oh Hashem, thank you so much. You give me this message. I need to be wow. aware about the words I'm reading. It's not only reading words, but there's so much meaning on this. And it gives me so much simcha. Yafet, Yafet, you, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the mitzvah, it's actually one of the 613 commandments. <laughs> Not to turn after your eyes and your heart. And you're right that the, the primary meaning is not to worship Avodah Zarah, not to stray after false gods. However, in are the words of our sages, they expand it, and for sure the words of our, our ethicists are Ba'alei Musar, they expand it tremendously to say in general, you should not stray after any bad influences. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a famous halacha book famous halacha book called the Mishnah Brura. It's a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. He brings in the beginning, the first page of his uh, halachic book, he brings that there's a concept, I can't remember now who says it first. The concept is um, that there are six constant mitzvot. 613, of course. But they don't always apply. Many of them only apply when there's a Bet Mikdash. Some of them only apply to Kohanim. Some of them apply once a year, Rosh Hashanah. Some of them apply every Shabbat, once every seven days. There's six mitzvot which are constant every minute of every day, 365 days a year. The six constant mitzvot. Let's see if we can think what they are. Fear Hashem. Fear Hashem, good. To love Hashem. Love Hashem. Uh, Excellent. To love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. It's interesting. Um, it's. Uh, I don't think it's listed in the six. It's a good question. Why not? You could love your neighbor at every moment, but it's not really uh, listed there in the six. Belief in Hashem. Good. You start off with number one. Belief in Hashem. There's a belief in Hashem. Love God. Fear God. Well, belief in Hashem goes together with, if you remember, we studied Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. God is our God, Hashem is our God, and God is one. So we have belief in God and believe in God's oneness, love and fear of Hashem, so we're up to four. Right. Two more. Constant mitzvot. Uh, so, to fear away from evil, something like that? From the... Um, so, so I think what you're referring to is the one that Ravid was speaking about. The constant mitzvah, you could say the flip side of, of, uh, of to believe in Hashem is not to believe in other gods, mm-hmm. right? To believe in one God and not others. And the last one he says is, you should not stray after your heart and your eyes. This mitzvah that Ravid mentioned to us. And of course, the primary meaning is, to not uh, worship uh, idols, but also it refers to other influences. Don't be led by your lowly desires. desires. That's it. But there's also one like yeah. not to believe in the other power besides Hashem. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. It's like the flip side of Hashem, uh, believe in Hashem and not any other power. Right. Those are the six he lists. And he says, oh, whenever you're waiting for the bus, you don't take the bus anymore. 
You live right here. You do still do. Oh, okay. Whenever you're just waiting in line at the uh, at the store or at the kupat uh, cholim at the doctor's office, whatever happens to be, you got a few minutes. You can just remember one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six mitzvot constantly. You can always do them. Uh, you have to do them always. Yeah. Uh, one time I was studying that, and uh, they explain it like it's also like a like a cube, a matrix that you make because Beautiful. of the six. It's like up, down, sides. Mm. And then you like in a protection. You're inside this cube. Constant. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. There's also another list of six. There, there's the Ashkenazi tradition has a list of six. Ariel might know the Sephardi mm-hmm. version that has a list of ten. But at the end of the morning services, there's something called the six remembrances. Mm-hmm. And all those these these uh, ideas, the Torah uses the word to remember. You should never forget them, and you should remember them. And there's also six. It's interesting. Six, six sides of a, of a cube. Perhaps it's. Uh, I have a book at home by Rabbi Ginsburg. You might have heard of him. He. Uh, <laughs> you have that book? With the in living in a space, the, the blue one. I think it's blue. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's from that I have. Ah, so that's. <laughs> a, <laughs> so the, ah, it's a very interesting book. And he says, of course, there's different ways that you can play with it in terms of exactly how to do it. But he says that you should build for yourself a, a Jewish consciousness that has these six, six things in mind at all time. And he develops the meaning of each one of them. I don't think he relates it to the sixth constant mitzvot. I don't think he relates it to the six constant mitzvot. He relates it there to the six remembrances, more so than the constant mitzvot. But, you know, they're... they're uh, you know, the Torah is so uh, malleable, so flexible, because there's so many different ways of interpreting each, each uh, remembrance, each idea. But uh, who, who knows what the six remembrances are? I recite them after prayers every day. So it says in my Siddur, mm-hmm. what are the six things that we must remember? You could remember right. ten. There's ten in your Siddur. I don't know if you recite all ten. But the Sephardim may add a few more, because there's other things. But the primary six... Does have one of the six remembrances? Exodus from Egypt, good. Revelation at Sinai. Revelation at Sinai, very good. Amalek. The golden calf. We sit in the golden calf. Ah, two more. Which, Miriam, that she's uh, her sin. And the last one? Which one? Shabbat. 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 Six remembrances, that's the Ashkenazi custom. And you have uh, more, you have ten, right? You have, uh, remember what, what Bilam, at the end of Shacharit service, the end of Shacharit service, in your Siddur. In your Siddur, usually. I think when we talk about Oh, really? It's a. Uh, yeah. Maybe you're referring to the uh, the thirteen attributes of mercy is what you're you're looking at. Vayavor. We're not looking at that. Look later on in this shachrit service. After uh, really at the far end, you found you found you have the. What? How many remembrances do you have in this siddur? Ten. Ten. You have ten. Yeah. Ah, ten remembrances. Yeah. Yeah, that's the Ashkenaz, the Sephardi version. Yeah. But in any case. Ah, Rishalayim. Miriam, uh, Miriam, we said already. Miriam, we have already. So Rishalayim. Bilam, no? Ah, Shem gives you strength. Remember, the Shem gives you strength to make wealth. Good. So, what else? Bilam. And what else? One more to make it ten. We didn't mention yet. We said that? The man. The man, the man. The Shem gave you the man. Gives you daily sustenance. That makes sense. Anyways, whatever it is, those are the things that... The point is that it's unclear, this list, because some of them there's actually a mitzvah to recite them by speech. Others you might be able just to remember and not to forget uh, in your mind. And that's why there's a debate about you know, what's included in the list. Uh, of course, we, res- we, we do co- commemorate the Exodus every day in the Shema. In the last paragraph of the Shema, we say, I am the Lord, you God, took out of Egypt. And that's uh, for sure uh, 
according to the Rambam, it's part of the mitzvah of Shema that we have to mention the, the Exodus. According to others, it's, it's a separate mitzvah, but it's something that should be recited every day. The others, it's not so clear that they have to be recited, although just to be safe, just to be safe, that's why we have this addition at the end of the Shacharit service, and we, we list them. We list them uh, if, if possible. So that's why I say sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but... Uh, I mean, the Exodus, I always do. It's part of the Shema. <laughs> but uh, there, there are others, if I get a chance, we usually, while I'm wrapping up my tefillin, mm-hmm. you, you can say those remembrances. If you know them off the heart, you, can, you could uh, remember them. Um, so in some ways, they're parallel to the six constant mitzvot, which I was mentioning now from the first Biur Lacha, the first commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. Anyways... Good. But there is so much more to remember. Uh, when I get up in the morning and I realize <coughs> that Hashem gives me the light again, like a newborn baby. Sure. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and <laughs> this, but it has much more meaning about this because I'm saying I can see, I can hear, I can smell, I can uh, talk, I can move, and then I realized... The morning blessings. Yes, mm-hmm. then I realized He made me perfect. I have everything what I need to have a life. So why I am complaining all the time, <laughs> I don't have this, why this happened, this is what we are doing, because we are living in a material world, and we always, not every book, we want maybe, but I think... I don't think I've heard you complain too much, Rafi. So you, you, you show us the nice face here. You, yeah. Your wife must get all the complaints, because here you're, 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 you're just so, positive. That's so good. I'm going back to the beginning of the day, and I say, you uh, made me perfect, I have everything what I need, so... I don't need to complain about anything. I need to be thankful and try to show him that I am thankful. Nice, nice, very good, very good. This is the the the, the surprise I had for you at the end of the last class. I said we we do it today. Pass these around. Uh, it's another chart, <laughs> so you can see at the top is the revelation at Sinai, and you can see a little bit of of. Um, The literature, it's called the Classification of Torah Literature, just put it down, thank you. Classification of Torah Literature, and there's some literature which developed from the Oral Torah, some which is maybe an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, <laughs> because literature is written, but it developed from the Oral Torah, we discussed why. Uh, that, you know, uh, the persecution of the Roman Empire, that they didn't want things to get lost. The first real book to be written down properly was the Mishnah, as you can see in the books of the Oral Law. Uh, And then afterwards, the Talmud, the Jerusalem, the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, many, many commentaries on each. And then finally we have also the Responsa and the Poskim in all the generations afterwards, which we'll have to discuss at a later date, but uh, we've, we've discussed that. But it's important to realize that not every box, every box in this chart has commentary. Lots of commentary, like this book, it says on a Talmud, right? And, but really, the Talmud is only the, the big letters in the middle. On the right, on the left, in the margins, on the bottom. These are all commentaries. In the back of the book, most of it is commentaries. Commentaries upon commentaries upon commentaries. This is not just the book of the Talmud. Talmud and commentaries. So you keep going down on the list. This is the, from the Babylonian Talmud. A question. The commentaries, are that from people from those uh, times, close the saints of this like. Everything oh, after, like the, everything uh, after the, uh, the Talmud. The Gaonim, Rishonim, Archonim. On the same page, we have commentaries from over a thousand years of... But not, of, uh, but not from 2009. Do you have some example? Maybe from the Rabbi Adam stands out? He's sure, sure. Till today, till this today. They, they, have, uh, they print uh, Talmuds with new commentaries all the time. Yeah. But, but, uh, but also like 
The, 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 Talmud, the, the one from the art, art scroll? Art scroll, yeah. Also, same kind of sure, the art the, scroll on the bottom, the, on, they have a page, a facing page in the art scroll. And if you've ever opened up a Gemara, they have the standard page of Talmud, the way it looks like this. And then on the other side, they have a page which is full of modern day commentaries written by, mm-hmm. by uh, scholars that are alive today. They're summarizing mostly, they're explaining in English for people that don't have the background. Not uh, in depth, the most in depth commentaries, but there's a combination. Yeah. Pictures, too. pictures is the yeah. best. Yeah. But the Mishnah, yeah. the Mishnah's yeah. around it, right? The Mishnah's inside as so, well. So, the so if you buy like, the, let me say, if you buy a, a, a Talmud Gemara, they have the Mishnah plus the. the, the, the it's Gemara. true, but we also have, as you can see here in this box, there's commentators on the Mishnah itself. Like Even Kahati? before, like Kahati is a good example, but also the Rambam wrote a commentary on the Mishnah. Actually, they put it in the book in the back to, so that you'll buy their volume. There's other commentaries throughout the years, throughout the period of the Rishonim and the Charonim, throughout a thousand years, people have been writing commentaries on the Mishnah and on the Talmud, a different sometimes uh, one and not the other. On the Boskim as well, on the Shulchan Aruch, there's commentaries, commentaries. Everything throughout this chain gets commentary. What? what this book, what this chart, what this chart shows you is that don't get lost and follow only the chain of the oral law. Mm-hmm. Baruch Hashem, Suyan, Shalom. There is also what we know of as the Torah Shabikhtav, the written Torah. And the written Torah also receives commentaries. Throughout the ages, in every era of Jewish history, the scholars have been studying it. What is the earliest, the earliest commentary on the Torah? Uh, what do you say? <laughs> the, 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 the prophets. The prophets. Good answer. You're right. That's not... Okay, what's the earliest commentary on the prophets? <laughs> Uh, I think I think the the, the, mishta, the midrash. Close, but no cigar. You are you are you are close. No, you're guessing well. That's 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 very good. The midrash is very early. It's from the period of the sages, and we they they are midrash, both halachic midrash and agadic midrash. But there's one other uh, uh, bo- work or or body of literature which is even earlier than the midrash. <laughs> No, Agada and Halakha just means two, two topics. Halakha is legal stuff, Agada is non-legal stuff. Right? You see, you see that over here? There's the Agadic Midrash and the Halachic Midrash. Midrash is from the words of the sages. There's only one thing, one group of scholars which were uh, earlier. What, what is earlier than that? Targumim, targumim exactly. Targumim. The Targumim. The Targumim, you see it says here, that's the translations. Primarily into Aramaic, the Aramaic, and also Greek. We know the Targum Shivim. This was before the period of the Tanaim. This was uh, during the Hellenistic period. The earliest commentary that we actually have on, on the Tanakh is from the translations into Greek and then into Aramaic. There's one into Syriac. It's called the Pshitta. It's a Syriac translation of the of the Tanakh. So. But then, throughout every era, of course, the Midrashim from the Tanaim, in a, in a form, it is, uh, it's much more than a commentary. It also includes much of the oral law, but it's, it's written as uh, a commentary on the Torah. And then, of course, we have it throughout the later eras with Rashi, Ramban, you know, the, you know those other. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Because I, I see in some, in most of the books, most of the Shiloh, they also talk about the Arba, Arbanel and the Malbim. Mm. Why, why did you not this as commentary? I don't know why. Well, they're just trying to give you, you know, yeah. a few, but a few examples. But the truth is, the Abar Banel and the Malbim were a little bit later. later. Later, they were at the end of the period of the Rishonim, the beginning of the Achronim. Okay. The Abar Banel, famously, he was uh, one of the exiles from Spain. Okay. Right? When was the Spanish? 14, Expulsion, 1492, same year as America was discovered, it's easy to remember. So that's, yeah, that's right, that's right. So uh, 16th century, that's already the period of the Achronim. 
This period of the Achronim. So the Barbanel is a very important Achron. Yeah. And the Malbim is even 200 years later than that. Malbim, I think, is 18th century, maybe, maybe 17th. I, I can't remember the exact date. But it's a, uh, I, think yeah. he's, I think he's later. I think he's 18th century for right. sure. Maybe even 19th, yeah. uh, the Malbim. But uh, he wrote a beautiful commentary and very, um, very um, useful for our modern sensibilities because he was closer to us and the que- types of questions that we ask. One of the things that the Malbim did, his name was Meir Leibush. So it's an acronym. Malbim is an acronym of his name. Mem Lamek. Meir Leibush um, Ben. I can't remember his father's name. But he was known as Malbim. And he, um, he was actually a great, great, great scholar. And people were angry with him, and they laughed at him because he didn't study in the Beit Midrash in the yeshiva, and he didn't teach in the yeshiva. Instead, he sat there writing his commentary. What was his commentary? He wasn't writing on the Talmud, on the oral law, which is the primary uh, activity of most of his scholars, the highest scholars. They studied the Talmud and the codes. What was he doing? He was writing a commentary on the written Torah. Why? You know what he did? His job, he took it upon himself to connect the oral Torah to the written Torah. Mm-hmm. To show how so many of the commentary, so much of the commentary, uh, that the explanations of the oral Torah in the Talmud actually comes from a very deep, insightful reading of the Torah itself, of the written Torah. So he tried to be a connector because there were people that tried to separate and say, hey, these rabbis, they're making stuff up. They're not, you know, the oral, the oral chain is, went off, uh, you know, far, too far away from the written Torah. And he said, no, I'm going to prove to you. There's a, a, a series of, of authors. At the beginning of the Enlightenment, when this type of thinking started to, this type of separation was, was becoming popular, they said, I'm going to stand in the breach and I'm going to make sure that you understand the words of the oral tradition are part and parcel, and they stem directly from a deep understanding of the written tradition. We cannot separate the two. So the Malbim, the Kitab Sofer, there's a few uh, writers of this genre, and maybe that's why you see him quoted a lot, because uh, in our modern day, we still have people that are, you know, uh, trying to pick apart our Judaism and, and our tradition. And uh, he, 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 he did a very important role. So that's why that's what he said, he, I don't care if people are laughing at me. I know that this is my, my task, what I have to do for all generations. And here he is, we are hundreds of 200 years later, still quoting his, his work. Um, this was, he took it upon himself to, to uh, tackle that issue. And that's why he wrote his commentaries on the Tanakh. Uh, amazing stuff. Anyways, I thought it was a, it's a nice chart. Any other questions about it? Any other, you, you understand? Uh, what, what, uh... Hakol. Hakol. No major. No major. What do you mean middle? What do you what, what do you mean medium? What do you mean? The, the student. A student. A student and the major. Major, uh, major. Mature, mature. Yes, yeah, slowly but surely, of course. You can't jump to 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 study uh, um, very complicated uh, PhD material before you get a first degree and then a second degree. And that, there's levels for sure. For the college uh, issue, all the issue need to need to teach a college. I'll tell you what we teach in yeshiva. Every yeshiva in the world teaches this. That's what we teach, more and more. <laughs> Everybody, if he's here. You bring him up to here. Oh. And if he's here, we bring him up to here. Oh. <laughs> and if he's here, we go to here, and here, and here. We try, right? Oh. Everybody on their own level. 
everybody on their own level, and uh, you know, you really shouldn't be studying too much Talmud if you don't know the Tanakh, and you shouldn't be studying too much Talmud if you don't know the Mishnah and uh, the Midrash. Of course, it's not a perfect world, and you can't just totally separate. So we do many things at once, right? You have one class in Mishnah and one class in Tanakh, one class in Parsha, one class in, in the, the codes, in Halakha. So we do it all at once. So we try to push you ahead on all different, different uh, parts of, of Jewish literature. The name of the yeshiva, um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think there are, there are different yeshivot. Uh-huh. Some yeshivot, I'd say it's more uh, divided by the level. Some yeshivot focus on, uh, you know, this level. Uh-huh. And some yeshivot focus on this level. So that's the division between different yeshivot, mostly. But uh, in the end, we're all in the same, on the same path. It's the same, it's one path that we're all trying to uh, progress. And, it's a and malit. It's a malit, it's an elevator, yes. And we're all trying to go in the same direction. Some yeshivot are, are designed for beginners, some for intermediate, some for advanced, and some for postdoc, you know. And uh, there's post-doc. many different... Postdoc means after doctorate, even oh. even more uh, advanced than, than a doctor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, it's true there are also some yeshivot which study more Tanakh, mm-hmm. and some study more Talmud. But mm-hmm. uh, it's not really it's true that everybody has to study Chumash and Navi. Mm-hmm. Uh, these people who, who are on a very advanced level, they say Navi. Parsha, study that by yourself. Don't need a class. <laughs> right? And so the classes will be more on the other topics. But each individual, they're assuming that you have that knowledge or that you have a private uh, course of study on your own. Because we have to be experts in all of the Torah. We have to know, try to know everything. How much percent of the students uh, like to become a rabbi? I'd say in this yeshiva, very few. Really? Very few. This, the, the yeshiva that say higher level. There are other yeshivas, right? Other yeshivas. A high turnout of, a high turnout of rabbis, right? And this, like, um, there, there are some yeshivas which are designed yeah, yeah, for teaching rabbis. The they have a hundred percent rate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I assume. Ninety. Yeah. Ninety. Yeah. They also, gives, they also teach people, educate people to become a rabbi. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are people that, uh, obviously when you want to become a rabbi, it's after you've studied, you know, um, all of this, and all of this, and then you focus more on the poskim, the halakha, from about all the generations. So there's, there's some yeshivot where you study primarily halakha. But you have to have already studied Talmud at a high level in order to understand more than Daf Yomi, <laughs> much more in depth than Daf. Daf Yomi usually is, is a cursory reading, one page a day. It's so fast. That's 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 uh, not not considered. Usually, it's not a very deep level of uh, of, of study. The Daf Yomi. It's good. It's very good. It's very good to have breadth of knowledge. For a rabbi, if he just studied Daf Yomi, he wouldn't be a very good rabbi. You have to study ta- Talmud in depth first, and then study the codes in depth. So for many, many years. How many years will it take to be a rabbi? From, uh, it's hard to know when, when do you Ten start years. when do you start counting? <laughs> so, so so some children they start studying Chumash in grade three, grade four, or even earlier. And then they're already on to Mishnah in grade five and grade six. And they're already into Talmud. I started learning Talmud. In grade grade four, I believe. <laughs> so how many years have I been studying Talmud? Ever since. So if we want to be a rabbi, every one of us, it will take a long time. <laughs> uh, 
You never know. I never say no. Some people pick things up very quickly. What's the and they're very bright. But yeah. somebody who has a background, who has been, you know, went to a high school where he taught, uh, they studied Gemara. I'd say 10 years is a good time. To actually do this course of study to become a rabbi, there's actually tests, official tests in this country anyways. Not everywhere, but in this country there's uh, an official test by the chief rabbinate of Israel. They have a whole series of uh, examinations on a specific topics. Yeah, there's, there's actually an official uh, title. You, you get a degree from the Rabbanut Rashid. It's called uh, Smicha. Smicha. Right. Right. So that could take uh, four years. It's a, it's a good time. What's good about the 10 years? A good day. It's a solid foundation. Like, uh, of course, you always need, and then you continue learning afterwards. <laughs> it's, uh, there, there's much more. There's much more. You can continue. There's more tests to become a daya, to become wow, a judge, yeah. a rabbinical judge. So the, I, I would love to, but uh, I have to prioritize. I wouldn't be able to be teaching you here if I was studying to be a Dayan. It's a full-time occupation to be studying for that. How long does it take us to be a Dayan? So there's a, a good course that I've been eyeing for a number of years. It takes approximately uh, 10 years. <laughs> full-time. Like so, uh, I don't know that I have 10 years out of my life, or that I should be taking 10 years out of my life. I should be studying part-time, though, of course, more than I am. Uh, the, these sections of halakha, which, uh, to become a dayan, to become a judge, but... Uh, um, I'm trying, I'm trying, to always striving <laughs> to go higher, to go more, more and more knowledge all the time. There's no, there's no beginning and there's no end. The beginning is Aleph Bet, <laughs> and uh, the end is uh, knowing all of the Torah. Okay, I hope this uh, was helpful. Let's open up our books and start uh, today's lesson. Wow. Okay. So we put the. Whoa, did you say? What? No. Yeah. It wasn't you? Okay. It was, uh, okay, fine, no problem. The customs of the three weeks. If you need to uh, play music for your profession or to dance, then it's allowed. If you can schedule a break, that'd be ideal. What about what about uh, singing and dancing for a mitzvah? It depends on the custom. There's some places where the custom is you can't. I'm on page 149. The custom is. Everybody must have a band with music, live music, at a bar mitzvah. Otherwise, the boy will feel like, oh, I didn't really have a party. You don't want him to be sad. You want him to be happy. Mm -hmm. So if that's the custom in the community, it's allowed even during the three weeks. Most people, though, they don't have music during the three weeks. And either they push off the celebration for a few weeks, or they have it without music. And they sing. You're allowed to sing and dance with singing, with your mouth, but not with uh, uh, mu instruments. Uh, so that's I, the custom. I, it, it, also, it says yeah. Down. That's one option. So that's one option. Yeah, that's one option. The big question is a mo big modern question. And here, that's section 4 on page 150, 151. There's different rabbis about listening to music nowadays when it's not a party. You're just privately listening to music. Earphones. Earphones. People put it on their little speaker. I have my home, I have a stereo. I have nice big speakers. I come home, I want to relax, listen to the music. Is that allowed? So public music is a sore, private music is allowed. That's one opinion. Very good. One opinion. Good morning, Hirsch. Good morning, Amos. <laughs> So some some people go with that distinction, as Hirsch said, uh, private versus public. Other people say, no way. Even in private, uh, this uh, you can have one of these for sure. Yeah, and one can. Uh, there's one there for Hirsch. He has one there. Um, you want to set one? <laughs> Thank you.
Some people say, even in private, we should not be listening to music, even though the origin is, you, did, you know, the custom was you don't have weddings. We said that the uh, Ashkenazi custom is for the entire three weeks we don't have weddings. Along came the Magen Avraham, and later, again, an Achron, a later commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, and he said, you shouldn't have any live music whatsoever. Even if you're not going to dance. Even if it's not at a wedding. He said, dancing and live music is not good. So what, what about listening to you? You're not going to dance. Most people, they listen to music to relax. Would you do like this? That's, that's you, there? you tell me, is that dancing? <laughs> if a woman is not in her head, you can look at her. <laughs> it's a form of simcha, that's right. But the question is, we have to really try to reach a definition of, of what's prohibited and what's not. So some rabbis say, well, anything that's public is, is uh, sort of going to go against the spirit of the times. And private is okay. Other people say, oh, even privately. If you are sitting there and you listening, enjoying the music, and you're smiling and clapping to yourself, that's also forbidden. <laughs> Some people say, you know, you know what the difference is? The difference is between whether they're playing musical instruments or they're singing with their mouth. Mm-hmm. Like we said before by the Brit Milah, most people today, we're going to have a, a bar mitzvah or a Brit Milah, if they don't push it off, they're not going to have a band, but you're allowed to sing, sing and clap and without instruments. So they say the same thing, on electronic devices. As a matter of fact, there is, in this country, religious radio stations designed for religious people. And they don't, uh, and they have Shirei Torah, and then they have music, Jewish music, religious music. Yes. What do they do during the three weeks? No, please. So they, there's a few different radio stations. They each have their own rabbi, and they each have a different policy. Some of them say, no music, and no instruments. And what do they have? A cappella. <laughs> they have people singing. And nowadays, we have beatbox. We have all sorts of beatbox. people that make uh, the sounds of instruments with their mouths. Yeah, that works perfectly. But there's even more. There's an entire industry now of making up music, recording music for people who want to keep the law and not listen to instruments. But there's a problem because many of the songs sound just like their instruments. You know, can you do it? Can you do beatbox? Well, I have a question about this. Right, I'm not an expert. So, so you can even have a happy song, a dancing song. You listen to it. Oh, I'm happy. I'm clapping my hands. Just like if it was instruments. Yeah. So other rabbis say that I don't want to use that definition. I'm going to use a different definition. I'm going to use a different definition of the type of song. Is it a slow, somber, solemn song? Not a dancing, joyful, uh, you know, makes you want to shake your, your booties, right? <laughs> there's, there's different, some rabbis say that. And even if there's music, if it's a slow song, if it's a nice slow violin, that's not prohibited by the letter of the law, and they make that distinction. So there's many, there's many different opinions about where to draw the line. Other people say, if it's uh, out loud or in your ears. If it's just earphones, you can do anything you want. But if it's public, then it's a problem. Uh, so there's different, different rabbis going different ways here. Um, Rav Melamed that you read, I don't know if you got a chance to get to the end of page 151 here. At 152, he says the halacha in practice, he has a complicated system. He's quite lenient. Uh, and says if it's a sad song or if it's not a jumpy song, you can, you can listen to it. He doesn't like the distinction between instruments versus a cappella because uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. You can, you can make your, your voice sound like an instrument, so what's the point? But uh, there are different, different attitudes, and uh, the main thing is you shouldn't have parties and have dancing parties with music. Um, for me, it helps me relax to listen to music while I'm learning, while I'm preparing my classes, while I'm doing my work. So I do listen to music during the three weeks. Of course, 
as we get closer to Tisha B'Av, as we get closer to the end, the nine days, the laws get more severe, as we're going to discuss when we get to them. And so then, and then on Tisha B'Av itself, like for example, on Shiva Sabbath Tammuz, I did not listen to any music, even though I did the next day, right? Well, not only Shiva Sabbath Tammuz this year, on the 18th of Tammuz, I also didn't listen to music because I was fasting. But on the 19th, I did, and when I'm driving in my car, I need the music to, to stop me from falling asleep, right? <laughs> so, or if you're doing sports, it makes you run faster. There's no prohibition on that. There's no absolute prohibition against music. It, it really depends on the context very much. But there are different opinions. There's different rabbis. And I'll take some questions. Ravid and, and Hirsch, yeah. Okay, I read the... It's refrain to play any instruments. Mm -hmm. When we are talking uh, that we make the sounds of the instrument by our uh, mouth, our voice. Right. My question is, what's the definition of an instrument? <laughs> but then my mouth is right. an instrument. It's a good question. I'll tell you the answer is because, and it's, it's not uh, trivial. In the Beit HaMikdash, they used instruments, right? The lyre, the harp. Right, the, the drum, uh, the cymbals, we all know about them from our prayers. We quote the Tehillim. So we know that the Levites played instruments in the temple. And of course, this is the period where we're commemorating the destruction of the temple. So it could be that there is a very special role um, of commemoration by not listening to actual instruments, something that you, know, uh, something that, uh, you play. Not, not just singing with your mouth, but the actual instruments, because that reminds us of the Beit HaMikdash more. And so, or it's, it's a type of, I will say one more thing before I take the other questions. I see your, your hands. Uh, it's coming. I'm coming to you. But I want to answer Ravid and then Hirsch and then Amos, okay, so if I can. Um, some people ask, how come it doesn't say clearly in the Halakha that you're not allowed to listen to music in the three weeks. Supposed to be That's one answer. The the probably the, the the most proper answer is if you uh, first of all, it's hard for us to imagine what society was like before we had all these digital devices. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to hear hear the violin, you'd have to hire a violinist to come into your home and play for you live violin. There was no recorded music. It's a re recent in invention. And so this was already festive to have a musician. Only the rich people could have a musician come into their home and play live music. In other words, it really was a festive event to have uh, music. Nowadays, it's a, it's a banal, regular, run-of-the-mill, everyday thing. We listen to music on the radio, in the bus, in the... <laughs> when you're showering, people listen to the music, everything. People are listening to music constantly. It's like we have a, what's that called? A soundtrack. Mm -hmm. A soundtrack to our life, right? Like in a movie, it has a soundtrack that the, and, uh, uh, the TV. So there's... But it didn't used to be like that. So it used to be a big deal. And the truth is that probably the, the best reading of the sources is you know why they don't discuss forbidding music? Is because during the three weeks, it was forbidden in practice all year long. What does forbidden in practice? Musical, making music, making dancing and parties. Unless it's a, for a, a wedding, unless it's for a ritual celebration, the, the morning for the temple, the simple reading of the law is, we should no longer play any music because we don't have the music of the temple. If we don't have the Levites playing their instruments in the temple, we, don't, uh, we, we can't forget about the, our mourning for the temple. And all the year long, people didn't listen to music. And that's why there's no law that says explicitly, don't listen to music during the three weeks. Well, of course you're not listening to the music because of the destruction of the temple. All year long we're aware of the destruction of the temple. But of course, life has changed, our society has changed, and what we do, the common custom of almost all Jews, is to play music uh, even 
uh, when it's uh, not a wedding, and uh, we we uh, that's that's the custom. Custom overrides the, the the simple reading of the law. But when we get to now, how do we define what do we do during the three weeks? This particular time period of the year where we more than the rest of the year we commemorate the temple. So here we have various levels of restrictions that we've been discussing about, okay? When I use my voice like an instrument, my voice, my mouth will be an instrument. Mm. If people perceive it, because these days Good. when we hear yeah. some people using their voice, right. I don't hear the difference. Yeah, that's what I mentioned it's before. Problem. That's why some people say it makes no difference. So it's, it's, my voice is an instrument. It could be, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, Hirsch, what's your question? Yeah. So we're, talk, we're talking about the difference between the popular certain things during three weeks or nine weeks in Russia. Nine, nine, weeks, nine, nine, weeks. So nine three, days, please, not nine weeks. Nine, nine, nine days. days. <laughs> Forgive me, English is not my strong suit. So, he's listening to music, parties, etc. Do they all follow neatly by the Sephardi Ashkenazi? No. Days, no. So, do you all have those different approaches that I was saying before, some folks. I don't have a chart of the different rabbis, if you're asking me. No, 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 no. Of time, what the practice? Time, action, yes. Practice, yes, I can get you such a chart. Um, it's not. Um, it's not comprehensive. There's many, uh, you know, in between customs. You have it right here. That's why we're studying this no, book. Chart, it has a very. Chart, okay. All right. Um, Amos, what was your question? Yeah, I have two questions. One is if someone is someone is uh, living by playing the music. We mentioned it in the pre. We, we mentioned it on page one fifty. It says that you're allowed. That that's your parnasa. Okay. You're allowed. Yeah. And then second question: If you have a depression, you can you can listen to music. I mentioned that in passing. That the, if the, the the rabbis, the poskim speak about this, that if someone needs to to relax, to calm their mind, hundred percent. Yes, you understand. A very uh, very uh, large room, wiggle room to be flexible. Some rabbis say everybody's nowadays in our generation we're so depressed that everybody needs some pick me up, especially after Corona. No, the rabbi spoke about it in Corona times uh, last year or two years ago. Whenever we were, it was the three weeks. The rabbi said, usually I say don't listen to music during the three weeks. This year, everybody can listen to music because. We uh, keep our spirits up. It's a mitzvah to be happy to, 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 to live our religious life. We need energy. If we're depressed, then we won't pray well, we won't study well, we won't be nice to each other. Everything falls apart if, you don't, if you're not happy. So by all means, the psychological component of how the music affects us is very important halachically. That's why I allow myself to, to listen to music. But my wife, it's interesting, we always have this debate. We've lived married now 30 years. Every year, <laughs> she <laughs> almost. Thank you. Um, we we uh, she doesn't listen to music, and I do. And every year, I show her listen the sources. Listen to this rabbi says it's allowed. This rabbi says, and and our latest insight was that we listen to music differently, which is very interesting. When she listens to music, she listens to all the words. And she's in it. She's in it. And, and it's, she's very attached to it. For me, it's background. It's very nice in the background. And uh, oh. I enjoy music. I enjoy the sometimes, you yeah, know. Uh, but we, we enjoy it. We, it's different. So it's very personal how you listen yeah. to music. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Okay, and next question, Micha. Yeah. Now, it's, a, that's, it's funny, like that in the Tehillim, I think one to seven. They say what by the witness of Babylon. Yeah. But then they say like uh, yeah, they want a song from us, but how can we say a song? So you see the connection. Precisely. Exactly. We hang them. up the lyre on the tree. We can't use the instruments. We're hanging the the music the harp on the tree. That's a <coughs> the Elim, <coughs> the rivers of Babylon. That's that's a sign of our mourning. We cannot sing the song of the Lord when we're in the exile. Exactly. That's the sentiment that we, we were describing. Yes, almost another. This is just a continuation of the first question. If someone is studying playing some guitar or some any instrument, and now with this three weeks game, uh, it's not like a really school or it's maybe. But he need to be ready for something, or he can do it. It's the same principle like with the. Same principle. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and if it's just a hobby and he started to do that like half year ago, and now oh, he can stop for a season. That's the, yeah. It's it's very it's very personal. It's very hard to know one rule for everybody. Yeah. The principle is clear that if it's something that's uh, joyous and bringing dancing, that's uh, more uh, problem. Uh, if it's uh, if it's for personal relaxing or for practicing or for your parnasa or for your your livelihood or um, there's other reasons, then uh, it, you know, or you're just listening by yourself. So. Which one of them is religious, which one of them is not? Um, so, right now I've been discussing the Ashkenazi custom. The, this entire discussion really is an Ashkenazi custom because Sephardim really keep the restrictions starting from Rosh Chodesh Av. For most of them? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the Sephardim have no restrictions right now. But many, many Sephardim actually. Uh, are influenced by the Ashkenazim too. Oh, we, we're very well aware. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Uh, hiking, swimming, hotel vacations. Uh, hopefully you... Um, uh, if you look at the bottom of page 153, um, really there's, not pro- there's no prohibition during the three weeks. Like I said, it doesn't really exist, the three weeks in Halakha, except for... The one things that are explicit is the Shachiano and uh, this discussion we're having about music. You can see how flexible it is because it's not really uh, a hard and fast law from the Talmud. Vacations, it doesn't say not to vacation. It doesn't say not to hike. It doesn't say not to swim. You're allowed to bathe till you get to the Rosh Chodesh Av. But for those two weeks beforehand, almost two weeks beforehand, um, so there's different customs. I think more and more the custom is that uh, because... For some reason, the month of Tammuz and Av always comes out in the summer the on the holidays. And the kids are away from school. Mm-hmm. And that, what are you going to take away three weeks out of their summer vacation? It's very difficult. So we most, most uh, post-game allow vacations and swimming and leisurely activities up until Rosh Chodesh. Uh, and then, um, of course, you have to do them with care because we said there's also the issue of dangers. So you always have to be a little more careful. But you can hike and swim uh, carefully. Um, when you get, look at the bottom page 153, the last paragraph, it says, When Av arrives, we curtail our joy. This is already from the Mishnaic, uh, you know, era. This is a central law. And therefore, we should limit our recreational activities for pleasure and joy. So if you're going to go on vacation, nine days is not ideal. Educational, it's allowed. Therapeutic.